Hi, I'm Ann Campbell, and today I'm going to talk about the key features of SonarCube 9.8. Faster analysis has been a theme in the 9 series, and in 9.8 we bring you faster Kotlin PRs with the addition of the same analysis cache that we've added previously for other languages. This server-side analysis cache means that unchanged files don't have to be reanalyzed in your PR. Unfortunately, I don't have numbers on that. We've also enabled parallel analysis report processing for PRs from the same project in Enterprise Edition and above. Now, Enterprise Edition already had the ability to parallel process analysis reports from different projects. Unfortunately, PRs and branches from the same project were blocking each other. We fixed that in 9.8, so PRs from the same project can be processed in parallel with each other and with branches from that same project. And now I want to jump into the UI to show you something else we did for PRs, file move detection. So here I am in 9.7 on my local host on a project that I've analyzed locally. And I want to jump into the issues um, and point out the issues in two particular files. So in this file here, version test, I have 22 issues. And then here in Update Center Serializer, I have 15 issues. Now I've created a PR and analyzed it that, up, that renames both of these files. Let's see what Analysis Report Processing in 9.7 does with that. So here we have 39 issues. You'll recognize most of them. You see that I did rename the file. I just stuck a 2 on there. And it re-raises all of the old issues in my moved files as new issues in the PR. Well, in 9.8, we fixed that. So here I have my two renamed files with only the two issues that were actually added in this PR. Yay! So now let's move on to rules. We've added, as usual, a whole bunch of new rules for you this time. So let's start with JavaScript and TypeScript. Last time, we added a bunch of new rules to help Python developers master the AWS CDK, and in 9.8, we've made those available to JavaScript and TypeScript developers. So we've added nine rules about encryption at rest and in transit, four rules for public access network and firewalls, and three rules around permissions and access controls. For Java and Kotlin, we've added two rules around block cipher mode, and this expands our coverage of OWASP ASVSv4, which is access control. We've also ported 17 rules from Java to Kotlin. So we've got a set around collections, some for equals and hash code, some for files and streams, one for database interaction, two for data classes, and several that I couldn't categorize, so I jumbled them here together. In addition, for C++20, we've got six new rules to help you use concepts well. So two rules to help you update existing code to use concepts, two rules about using concepts and requires with templates, and two rules on properly writing your own concepts. Now I want to jump into the UI and show you an example of an issue from this last rule. So here we've highlighted the requires keyword with secondary locations on these two uses of decalval. Now let's jump into the rule description. We put a lot of effort into making these rule descriptions helpful so that you understand not just what you should change, but why you should change it so that you write the code better next time. And with this rule description, what we learn is that not only is the new syntax easier to read, as we see here in the compliance solution, but also that if you're using the old syntax, it's possible that you will get a type that's not quite what you're expecting. So if you're already compiling to C++20, you probably want to go ahead and update your syntax to use the new stuff, and our rules can help you do that. Also in rules, um, I want to point out that for PHP, Python, JavaScript, and TypeScript, we've vastly expanded uh, and improved the rule descriptions for the Tain Analysis rules. Um, security can be tough. Uh, we understand that. So we've added a lot of context to, and content to help you understand what could go wrong, why this is an issue, and more importantly, when you need to fix it, guidance that's specific to your framework to help you do the right fix in the right place. While I'm on rules, I want to point out that as a supporter of Sarif, we have implemented Sarif. So if you have other tools that are producing Sarif reports, you can now import those in SonarCube 
Moving on to projects, I want to talk about project creation. So for a while now, when we've imported projects from a DevOps platform, we automatically read and honored the name of the main branch from that project. There were a couple of cases, though, where we weren't properly picking up because we couldn't the name of the main branch. So one is manual project creation here through the interface when you're filling in the values your, yourself. So we've added here an input so you can provide the main branch name in addition to the project display name and the project key. As you see, it defaults to main, but you can change it to whatever is appropriate for your project. So maybe it should be developed. And there we go, we would set that up. Now that still doesn't address when projects are created automatically by your pipelines. So we've set that up as well here in global administration where the, a global administrator can set the default main branch name for the entire instance. In addition, we've added one more thing which is a login message. Now, people have been asking for this for quite a very long time. Um, the use for this is when you have multiple different systems. So as a user, I might be confused when I come to the SonarCube login screen and not know which credentials to use. So an administrator might type something like, use your LDAP credentials. And if I save this, if I enable it, there are two steps to this, and I log out, and I log in again, there's my message. Now I want to end with two more ops advances. So on the theme of user management, we've enabled skim user provisioning and deprovisioning for SAML Okta. Uh, the big part here is that when a user is removed, um, SonarCube will get the message, deactivate the user, and all the user's tokens. And finally, now you can run the server with Java 17, which is the Java LTS. And that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for listening. See you next time.